Okay, so options are a derivative. A derivative is a financial security that derives its value based on an underlying asset. And we're going to be talking about stock options in here, but there are other kinds of options. <clears throat> so what is the definition of an option? An option gives you the right, but not the obligation, to do something. And so let's give you some examples of options here. First of all, this optional final exam, you have the right to take the final exam, but uh, not the obligation, meaning you don't have to do it as long as you have taken those first three exams. So that's one example of an option. Another example of an option, when you were accepted to Missouri State University, I'm sure it was the highlight of your life so far, you had that letter and it said, congratulations, you have been accepted at Missouri State University. That gave you an option. You had the right to attend here, but did you have the obligation? No. Was anybody here accepted somewhere else? Yeah. Did you have to go there? No. Okay. Uh, another one. When you receive a job offer letter. When you receive a job offer letter, you have the right to take the job, but you are not under the obligation to take the job. And we're going to talk about how, and if, if I don't, remind me, we're going to talk about how job offers and options have something in common, and that is you should never exercise an option early. You should never exercise an option early. Okay, another option that you may run into in your life is the option to marry someone. When I ask my wife to marry me, she's now, she now had the right, but not the obligation, to marry me. Thankfully, she exercised the option. Now remember I just said that it's not optimal to exercise an option early. And some people will apply this thinking to the marriage option. But there's a problem with that thinking because what happens the longer you wait? Ms. Hip, you seem to have an idea. I mean, you might have people that have kids, the person you like might find someone else. Yeah. And so, uh, so let's just put it in the big picture. So she's putting it, you know, and men hardly ever think about this whole thing, but if you want kids and you're female, you probably have some sort of deadline on, on getting this thing to work out, right? Okay, so let's talk about the, the people that you like not being available. So I have a friend who shall remain nameless, and uh, she, uh, she got lots of uh, attention from men when she was younger, and she was waiting and waiting and waiting and she was she got a blind date with this guy and he had like three kids and some other stuff going on I mean kids are great but I don't really want to raise three kids that aren't my own or actually I don't raise any that are, that are my that are my own right <laughs> so back to the story I said oh there are lots of fish in the sea and she said no she said when you get to be my age it's no longer a sea it's a puddle Right? And so you see this thing shrinking down. So you can apply this to lots of things in your life, including job offers, but you should definitely not apply it to the whole marriage thing because there are other dynamics going on there. And by the way, technically I should tell you that in some cases, if dividends are being paid, it may be optional to exercise an op or optimal to exercise an option early, but that's well beyond the scope of this course. Questions so far? Okay. Let's see here. Oh, so it gives, and we're talking about um, in finance, it gives you the option, it gives you the right, but not the obligation to buy or sell something. Now, the same option will not give you both rights. It'll either give you the option to buy or the option to sell. And those options have different names, and we're going to talk about those. And then there has to be a date upon this, is, uh, which is this is we're agreeing that this thing is going to be settled out or expire. 
And it's kind of like with a job offer letter. Typically, if your employer is smart, uh, what they'll do is they'll say, we need to hear from you by May 24th, <coughs> something like that. They'll put an expiration date on it. That is, and we refer to that as expiry, E-X-P-I-R-Y. And when I put expiry up on the board, sometimes I have students tell me I have misspelled expiration. Here's what you need to know. Expiry is a British word for expiration. And in fact, when you pick up a carton of yogurt in the UK on the bottom, it may, instead of saying expiration date, it'll say expiry, and it'll put the date. So don't be freaked out by that weird little word. And the final piece of it has to be the price agreed upon. So we're going to agree on a price today that we'll be able to do this buying or selling at at this given date in the future. So those are the basic options, basic components of an option. And if the person that owns the option, the person that has the right or the obligation, if they go ahead and use that option to either buy or sell the option, uh, item, which is the underlying asset, then we call that the, we call it exercising the option. Exercising the option. So when my wife uh, married me, she exercised the option that I gave her when I proposed. When you accept a job offer, you are exercising the option that the employer has given to you. Okay. The strike price or exercise price is that price we've agreed to, to out there at the end of the life of this option. And that doesn't change over the life of the option. It's kind of like the face value on a bond. It's going to stay the same over the life of the option. And then finally we have expiry or the expiration date. And that is the maturity date of the option. On, so let's say it expires on May 31st. On that day, if you don't exercise it, the option becomes worthless and it goes away. It just dies. Any questions so far? Okay. Now let's talk about European versus American options. A European option only allows you to exercise it at expiry. So in our example here of the option expiring May 31st, the only day that you would be able to buy or sell the underlying asset for that, using that option, would be on the expiration date. That's different than an American style option. An American style option allows you to exercise the option any time up to and including the expiry date. Let me say that again. An American option allows you to exercise it any time up to and including the expiry date. So you don't have to remember what I told you about op exercising options early if it's a European option because you don't even have the ability to do that. But with an American style option, you do. Now we're going to talk about what to do if you want to get out of this situation you could simply just sell the option to someone else. You could simply sell the option to someone else instead of exercising it early. Now we talk about options being in the money. They're in the money if exercising the option would result in a positive payoff. If you get a positive payoff. Now, we're going to see that there's a difference between the payoff to an option and the profit. Because the payoff is simply what happens when you exercise it. The profit also takes into account what you paid for the option. Because no one is going to give you this right but not the obligation for free. And in fact, we're going to call that amount of money that you pay in order to get this option, we're going to call it a premium. Where else do we hear the term premium? Anybody here drive a car? Are you legal? What, what do you have on your car that allows you to drive legally? Insurance. Insurance. And in order to have the option to collect in the case of an accident, what do you have to pay? A premium. A premium. 
And if you don't pay the premium, then you're out of luck, right? And so when we look at payoffs, it's just the money that happens when you exercise it. The profit is going to be payoff minus the premium. Okay. Out of the money, the exercising the option would result in a negative payoff. Negative payoff. Now, the question is, would we ever exercise an option that is out of the money? No, it's stupid, right? It's stupid to exercise an option that's out of the money because in addition to the premium that you're going to lose regardless, which by the way, we could call a sunk cost at this point, you are also going to lose money on exercising the option. I actually sold some options one time, call options, and I'll explain to you the safe way to do that. And the strike price was, let's say it was 30, and I had some idiot exercise it at 28, when they could have gone out instead and just bought the stock for 28. Now they end up paying 30 for it. It's ludicrous. And so obviously someone was playing in the options market who should not have been. By the way, one of the things that I want to get through to you as we talk about options, some of you may have a Robin Hood account. Ms. Flowers. Yeah, she, she's pleading ignorance. <laughs> okay, so the, one of the big things that we see with Robin Hood accounts is people playing with options. And there's actually been a young man commit suicide over his option trading on Robin Hood. I'm going to teach you how these things work. And I'm going to teach you how to do one transaction safely. But other than that, you should just stay away from this stuff because it's very dangerous, uh, even for knowledgeable people, but it's extraordinarily dangerous for you guys. By the way, you have a little knowledge after, if, assuming you pass this class, you have a little knowledge. And what you need to know is that a little knowledge is dangerous, right? You're like, oh yeah, I'm a freaking expert on that now. No. By the way, did you see what happened to Robin Hood stock? Oh my goodness, Robin Hood is deep in the toilet. And of course, you know, that doesn't hurt me in the least because I think they're a bunch of shysters anyway. Okay, back to the story. Questions? If you own the option, are you happy if it's in the money or out of the money? In the money. If it's out of the money, are you gonna exercise the option? No. Okay, let's talk about the call option. Remember I told you that the buy and the sell option have different names. The option to buy is called a call option. The option to buy is called a call option. It gives the holder, which we would also say is the person who purchased the option, the buyer, it gives them the right but not the obligation to buy a given quantity of some asset on or before sometime in the future, that's an American style option, at prices agreed upon today. Now, let's talk about that given quantity of some asset. For stock options, the quantity is always 100 shares in a contract. An option contract is always for 100 shares. Let me say that one more time. An option contract, <coughs> bless you, an option contract is always for 100 shares. Bless you again. Okay, so here we go. When you start doing homework assignments and they talk about a contract, know immediately that that contract is for 100 shares. I don't even have to tell you that. It's kind of like the face value of the bond or the liquidating value of preferred stock. It's a number that we all just know and work with. 100 shares per contract. Okay. And if you exercise the call option, you call in the asset. Now let's talk about the other person on the other end of this transaction. This person, we say that they have sold the option or that they wrote the option. So the writer of the option is the one who does the selling. The writer of the option is the one who does the selling. They do not have an option. They have sold that option to someone else. If the other person uh, says that they have to sell them 
that stock at the strike price, then the writer or seller of the option has to do it. They don't have a choice. Okay, now let's talk about two kinds of call option writing that you can do. One of them is fairly safe. The other one is extraordinarily risky. Let's talk about the safe one first. Remember we said that the minimum uh, that you could sell a contract, option contract for would be 100 shares. And so back in the day, what I did is I bought 100 shares of a company and the ticker symbol was Gene, G-E-N-E. -E. And they did biotechnology stuff, but I really didn't care because all I wanted to do was buy something that I knew I could sell call options on. And so because I owned that underlying stock, it didn't matter how high the price went on that stock, I knew I was not going to go bankrupt by writing that call option because I had the stock to hand over if I got called out. And that's what would have happened there if they exercised it, I would have said I was called out. So I had those shares to hand over. Now, that's called a covered call. That's called a covered call. If I own the underlying shares, it's called a covered call, meaning that I can cover the call if I get called out. Now, the other one sounds way more exciting if you just listen to the name, and that is the naked call. The naked call. This is exciting and sexy as finance gets, the naked call. Does anyone have any idea what the naked call might be? You don't own the shares. And so here you've gone and you said, I will give you the right but not the obligation to buy these shares from me at $30 a share. Now, if you're lucky, then the stock price stays below $30 a share you collect the premium and you go on about your merry way. However, what happens if the stock price goes, say, to 45? Is the other person going to exercise their option? Oh, hell yeah, it's in the money by $15, right? Now, what does that mean you have to do, person who's naked in this option? You get a few shares. You gotta go out there and buy those shares. And how much do you have to pay for them? 45, and then you have to turn around and sell them for what? 30. 30. Is that a good business model? No. Okay. So this is, uh, this is the problem with going naked. And by the way, what is your maximum potential loss from selling a naked call, theoretically? Well, uh, it's, we're talking money here. Let's talk money. How, how many dollars could you theoretically lose? Yeah, what's, what's the theoretical maximum stock price? Infinity. Yeah, we, we don't have any theoretical limits to how high stock can go. If you don't believe me, just look at Tesla, right? It's like, or Warren Buffett's thing, right? No one would have thought that stocks could get this kind of expensive, but they have. And so what happened, and by the way, are there opportunities where stocks climb very quickly like that? Absolutely there are. And so you could end up having to go out and pay a boatload of money for stocks that you have agreed to sell at a very low price. Now let me tell you what happened with my company, Gene, G-E-N-E, -E, that I bought. I had no idea why people were interested in options on this company because at this point I had no idea about pretty much anything. But here's what they were doing. They were doing research. And if they made a huge breakthrough, what would happen to the share price? Whoop, right? And so um, if, they, if they made the huge breakthrough, you would want to be owning some call options on that firm. And so basically what I was doing was providing a service to people who were uh, basically betting on these people making this huge discovery. Now, the story has a both happy and a sad ending. 
I decided finally that I got tired of messing with this and it makes your taxes a mess because it's all short-term gains and all that kind of crap. Anyway, so what did I do? I decide I'm going to sell these shares and I had bought these shares for seven dollars a piece. And what I decided to do was put out a market order. Do you know what a market order is? No, 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 not a market, a, a limit order. I put out a limit order there that said I want to sell this if it gets to $21 a share. Now I had $7 in it. I'm not a greedy man. 200% profit from 7 to 21. Well, that's, you know, that's fine. Okay, so the day arrives. And I get a ping from, back then it was just Ameritrade, get a ping from Ameritrade and they're like, your stock sold. And I'm like, yay. And I'm feeling really good because I know I made a 200% profit. But then I look at my account and I see that the stock actually had sold at 22. I'm like, woohoo, thank you Ameritrade. They got me some extra money. But then I got to thinking, why did I end up getting an extra dollar? The trick was the price of this thing was going up so fast that by the time Ameritrade pulls the trigger at 21, the stock price has already risen to 22. And then the sick feeling starts to settle on me. Any guesses how high this thing went? Oh, higher. 106. Now, do you see what I mean about it was a happy and sad event? Now, what if I had sold naked calls on that thing for 22 or 21 dollars a share exercise price? Now I'd be 106 minus 81, 85 dollars in the hole, 85 times 100 because you got to have 100 for the contract, right? I'd be out $8,500. By the way, at that point in my life, I probably didn't have $8,500 that I could just... Does that make sense? So, if you're going to sell call options, if you're going to write call options, I encourage you to write covered calls because you'll never wind up in the poorhouse as a result of having done so. Now, you may not get crazy rich, but you won't get crazy poor. Naked calls, as exciting as they sound, can put you into bankruptcy. So I don't recommend that at all. Questions? Yeah. For call options, always, uh, the contract's always having 100 shares. Is that just for homework purposes or is that? Oh, no, that's in real life. Oh, yeah. So this is when I started playing this game. The, one of the first cruel things that I learned is Chicago Board of Options Exchange, uh, that it's 100 shares. And if, if, I, if I hadn't have figured it out on my own, here's what usually happens. People are like, oh, yeah, I want to do options for 100 shares. So they put in an order for 100 of the options. Oh, damn. What are they up to now? What's 100 times 100? I think it's like 10,000, right? Yeah, oh yeah, just make very, very sure. So I never sold more than one contract at a time because I never had more than 100 shares of the same thing. Some people actually do this for every single thing in their portfolio. They're constantly selling covered calls for as many contracts as they can. And you can just make a nice steady income on that. The problem, though, happens when companies go whoop. You miss out on that upside. Does that make sense? Okay, good question. Now, let's talk about call option pricing at expiry. That means on that very last day they're alive. And so on the very last day they're alive, an American option call option is going to be worth exactly as the European call option. It's worth the same thing with the same characteristics. What do we mean by characteristics? Expiration date, strike price, I think that's about it. If the call is in the money, then it is worth S sub T. What is S sub T? It is the stock price on the expiration date. S sub T is the stock price on the expiration date. And then we're going to subtract E, which is the exercise price. Okay, so let's explain what that means. If the exercise price is 30, 
and the stock is selling for 35, the payoff would be 35 minus 30, and that $5 times 100 would go to the person that bought the option contract. Does that make sense? They're getting that payoff. Now, does that consider how much they paid for the option? No, it doesn't consider what they paid for the option. Okay, if the call is out of the money, it's worthless because we said no one should exercise an option that is out of the money. It's just making you lose more money. So you just walk away and let that thing die a quiet death without exercising it. And so therefore, we could say the value of a call, C, is equal to the max, meaning maximum, of either S sub T minus E or zero. If E is greater than S sub T, S sub T minus E is going to be negative. Is that going to be greater or less than zero? Yeah, you always want to go with the maximum. In that case, zero would be the maximum. But if S sub T is greater than E, if the stock price is greater than the exercise price, then that value is going to be S sub T minus E. Always go with the maximum. Questions so far? Okay. <coughs> By the way, this is probably a good lecture for you to go back and watch the video because nobody gets this stuff the first time through. So now let's talk about the payoffs uh, from a call option, from buying a call option. And, and look at the screen there, it says buy a call. The strike price on this thing, or the exercise price, is $50. If the stock price remains below $50, so if it remains in this region, then that option is worthless to the holder. It's worthless. Only once we hit the strike price or exercise price do we see the value of that call or the payoff start to rise. And it rises a dollar for every dollar that the stock price goes up. The value of the call rises a dollar for every dollar that the stock price goes up. And it's really easy to see why because the stock price minus the exercise price that stock price goes up by a dollar, then stock price minus exercise goes up by a dollar because the exercise price does not change over the life of the option. It stays the same. And so if the stock goes up by a dollar, then that payoff goes up by a dollar too. And in theory, uh, the payoff to this thing could be infinite because we said stock prices, in theory, can go to infinity. Now, by the way, let's talk about, remember I told you the potential losses for selling naked calls was infinity? In any derivative, it's a zero-sum game. Do you know what a zero-sum game is? If I lose a dollar, you make a dollar. If you lose a dollar, I make a dollar. Stocks are not a zero-sum game. You could put your money in. We could all put $10 into a stock and we could all get rich, right? It's not a zero sum game. But with these derivatives, including options and futures contracts, all those sorts of things, if one person makes money, the other person loses an identical amount of money. Does that make sense? Okay. Now that's just the payoff. Remember, we told you that the profit has a little different look to it. And the reason is because you have to pay that premium. In order to get the potential payoff, you have to pay a premium of $10. And so what that means is that your profit is negative 10 on this deal until we hit the exercise price. And once we do, then your profit starts to gain a dollar for every dollar the share price goes up. Now, here's a common misunderstanding from students. They say, well, wait a minute, I'm not going to start making a profit until I hit 60. 
And so I shouldn't bother exercising until I hit 60. Is that correct? No. Think about this. If it goes to 51, I've only lost 9. If I don't exercise, I've lost 10. Does that make sense? And if it goes to 58, now I've only lost 2 instead of losing 10. So the rule is, at expiry, always exercise in the money options. At expiry, or expiration, always exercise in the money options. Even if you are still making a negative profit, you are lowering your losses if you exercise and in the option, in the money option. Okay, do you see the difference between payoff and profit? The profit is just the payoff minus the premium. In fact, everything we have up here is exactly $10 lower than in the prior slide. So everything just shifts down by $10, and that's because you had to spend that $10 to get this pattern of payoffs. Now let's talk about put options. Put options give the holder the right, but not the obligation, to sell a given quantity of an asset on or before some time in the future at prices agreed upon today. And so if we exercise that put option, you put the asset to someone else. Now let's talk about how a put option would be helpful for you. Let's say that right now you own 100 shares of Tesla. But you're concerned that the value of Tesla might fall. What you could do is sell a, or you could buy a put option contract that would allow you, that would have an exercise price similar, slightly below where you're at right now. It would protect you against losses but if the stock price goes up, you could just let it expire. And so a put option to the holder is like an insurance contract against stock prices going down. A put option to the holder or the buyer is like an insurance uh, policy against the stock price going down. And what do you have to pay in order to get that insurance policy? A premium. You have to pay a premium to get that insurance policy. Now let's talk about the person on the other end of this transaction, the person writing the put option. They're agreeing to pay, let's say $30, they're agreeing to pay $30 for shares uh, at a certain point in the future. When are they going to get forced to buy those assets? when the share price is lower than $30. So here they go, you know, the, the share price falls all the way down to $12 a share. Now the person who has this, who, who sold this put option, they have to pay the holder of the option contract $30 per share in order to own shares that are only worth 12. So they're going to lose $18 per share. How many shares in a contract? 100. So they're going to lose $1,800 for every contract that they wrote. And so I would not advise you to write put options because it's not like the covered call where I can kind of cover myself. Uh, if any of you figured out how to figure out how to do a covered put, please let me know. Questions? Okay. So, just like with a call option, that put expiry, an American put, is worth exactly the same as a European put. If it's in the money, then it's worth the exercise price minus S sub T. Keep in mind that this thing's only going to be exercised if the stock price is lower than the um, exercise price. If the stock price is lower than the exercise price, then this thing is in the money. 
because it's the insurance policy against that low stock price. So that's when it's going to pay off is when the stock price is below the exercise price. And so if it's out of the money though, it's worthless. When is this thing out of the money? When the stock price is above the exercise price. If you own a put option, you are hoping the stock price drops below the exercise price. If you sell a put option or write a put option, you are praying that the stock price does not fall below that exercise price because that's when you start to lose money. And so once again, we have this way of, of uh, valuing these things. We could say on the expiration date, this thing is worth the maximum of either exercise price minus stock price or zero. If the exercise price is greater than the stock price, that first thing is positive, therefore it would be the maximum value. If the stock price is higher than the exercise price, then that first part is negative and the maximum would be the zero. Does that make sense? Okay. So here are our put option payoffs. This is the, option, the payoffs to buying a put. And the way to look at this chart is not to start at the left and work right, but to start at the right and work left. You want to start over here, and this thing has an exercise price of $50. If that stock price is falling, 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 but it doesn't get down to 50, this thing has a zero payoff. However, once we hit the exercise price, this thing gains a dollar worth of value for every dollar the stock loses. After we get down to the exercise price, this thing gains a dollar worth of value for every dollar that the stock price goes down. It's a one for one. And the best that you can hope for is for the stock price to go all the way to zero because that would maximize your payoff from owning or buying this put. It would maximize your payoff. And so you're watching this thing and you're going, come on, baby, all the way to zero, right? You want these people to declare bankruptcy and watch that stock crater because that's going to maximize your payoff. Now, what about the poor schmuck? Who sold you this option? Yeah, they're in big trouble because for every dollar that you're picking up here, they're losing one. Uh, let's assume it goes all the way to zero. How many shares in a contract? 100. What's 100 times 50? Oh, come on, people. Mr. Bohm, what's 100 times 50? 100 times 50. 5,000, thank you. See, this is the problem. You and I grew up with math where they didn't let us use calculators, right? Y'all get to use calculator in grade school? Oh, that was, that was an anathema to our generation. Okay, back to the story. 5,000 bucks! So here you've sold this, this put option and you think you're pretty clever and then the company goes bankrupt. By the way, do, do co some companies just whoop, go to zero? Oh yeah, if you find out it's a fraud, it can go to zero in a big hurry. Okay, so you could wind up losing 5,000 bucks in this case. Now, let's talk about the put option profits here, the options, or the profit from buying the option. Remember that it's basically just the payoff minus the premium. The profit is always just the payoff minus the premium. And so all we did here is move this thing down by the premium, and in this case the premium was $10. And so now we can look at this thing and we see that the profit is minus 10 right until we get down to $50. If we go down to 49, now the profit is minus 9. If we go down to 48, now it's minus 8. And so, oh, dude's at the wrong room. Uh, so it goes it's basically the opposite of the call option here, right? And so what we're saying is you would definitely want to exercise this option even if it hasn't gotten quite to this break-even point. Oh, by the way, that's another definition. What is the break-even? In this case, it's going to be the strike price 
minus the premium, the strike price minus the premium. It's just where you end up with zero profit. That's the break-even point. But after the exercise price, then every dollar this thing loses, then your profit goes up by a dollar. So it's just the payoff minus the premium. Questions? Okay. Now let's talk about the option value. So far, everything we've looked at, we've been talking about the intrinsic value. The intrinsic value is just for a call option, stock price minus the exercise price or zero, whichever is higher. And for the put uh, option, it's the exercise price minus the stock price or zero, whichever is greater. Now, all you have left on the ex expiry day is intrinsic value. All you have left at the end is intrinsic value. But any time up to that, there is going to be some additional value to this thing because of speculative, the speculative value. So let's talk about that. If I have a, an option to allow me to buy the stock at $30 a share, and the stock's currently trading at $29, and there's 30 days to expiry, is there still a chance that that stock price will rise above 30 and my option will be in the money. Yeah, it's entirely possible. And if I sell a, or if I buy a put option with an exercise price of 30 and the stock's currently trading at 35, is there still a chance with 30 days left that this value is going to fall down below that and my option would be in the money? Yeah. And so that that value of this un the unknown th I mean, things of the future, that is the speculative value. And so if you want to know the two components of an option premium, there is the intrinsic value and there's the speculative value. So here's something I can tell you. If you've got a call option on a stock that has an, expiry, uh, uh, has an exercise price of 30 and it's currently trading at 33, we know that that stock has an intrinsic, that option has an intrinsic value of $3, right? $3 per share. That means if I've still got 30 days left, I can go out there and look, anything over and above that $3 is speculative value. Anything over and above the intrinsic value would be speculative value. You will not be able to go out there and find options selling for less than their intrinsic value. It's just not going to happen. And so we know in this case that option is always going to be at least three bucks, and it's going to probably be more because of the speculative value. And the further you are away from the expiration date, the higher that speculative value will be because the greater the opportunity for this thing to then go into the money. Does that make sense? The longer the time to expiration, the more valuable the, oper the option is because it gives it more of a chance to, for the stock to reach a value that the option is in the money. Questions? So what does this mean? If you buy a, an option and the stock price then just stays the same, the intrinsic value of that is going to stay the same, but that speculative value will go lower, 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 the quicker, the closer you get to expiry. And on the final day of the option's life, that speculative value is zero because there's no time left for the stock price to go up or down. Questions? Now, let's talk about the other end of this deal, selling options. The seller or writer of the option has an obligation. They do not have the ability to walk away from this. They have to do what the other person wants to do. They have to do what the buyer uh, is paying them for, and that is that option premium that they receive in exchange. And so you get the premium the minute that you sell the option but then you have to wait to see if there's going to, if you're going to get exercised, if you're going to lose any money on being exercised on. So here we have our call option payoffs for selling a call. 
And this is what I was doing. I was selling calls. Of course, I owned the underlying stock. But what I would do is I would sell a call option with a stock price that I thought was comfortably above where it probably would go. And then I would uh, sit there and collect my full payoff of zero. But if the stock price went up and I ended up having to sell that stock, then I would have a loss. Because remember, I could have sold for 106 when I sold for 22. That's the kind of loss we're talking about here. If you're covered, if you're naked, it's just a straight up loss, right? Okay, now, what would the call option profit look like? And I don't actually have a uh, slide for this one, so I'm just going to have to draw a picture for you. This is call uh, sell call profit. So this is for this same option. And we're going to sell that call for $10. And we've got our exercise price out here at 50. What's going to happen is that my profit is going to be $10 right up until I hit that strike price. And then it's going to drop for a dollar every dollar that the stock price goes up. So since I had $10, and then if it raises to 60, now my payoff is negative 10. That's where my profit would be zero. And that would be my break-even point. Does that make sense? So this is the profit from selling a call. As long as it's below the exercise price, you get to keep that premium and no harm, no foul. Questions? Now let's talk about put option payoffs. This is from selling a put option. If you sell the put and the stock price remains above the strike price, then you don't lose any money on the payoff. The payoff is zero. However, if the price falls below the strike price, then you lose a dollar for every dollar that the shares go down, the stock price goes down. So we're gonna lose a dollar for every dollar the stock price goes down. And so the max we could lose on this would be minus 50. That's, that's on the payoff end. And so minus 50 times 100 minus 5,000 bucks, you could be out 5,000 bucks if you sold this put option to someone. Now, why would we do that? because of this premium that they're going to offer us. So let me draw you another picture because I don't have a picture of the profit in the slides. So here we go. This time I'm going to sell once again for 10 and I've got my strike price out here at 50. And my profit is going to be ten dollars starting right here at fifty. Oh, yeah. Actually it's gonna be at sixty, isn't it? Puts were never my good field. Okay, so I've got my $10 until we get down to this 50. Does that make sense? Because I'm not gonna lose any money until we hit 50. But after that, I start to lose a dollar of value for every dollar that the stock price falls. And so what's my break even going to be? Any ideas? Say again? 40, very good. So my break-even point is going to be here at 40. And my maximum loss on this is going to be minus 40. 
And it makes sense because our, our minimum payoff is minus 50 from selling this thing. So the minimum profit would be that plus the premium that we receive at the beginning. And so this is how, oh, let me put up here. This is still a put. That's what the profit looks like for selling a put. So what does that mean? It means that as long as this thing stays above 40, you're actually making a profit. If it stays above 50, you get to keep that whole 10 bucks. Does that make sense? Okay. Let's talk about option quotes. And they, this is the way it works. You end up with Basically, so in this case, we're looking at IBM, and the strike prices are in $5 increments. And depending on the stock price, it may be in smaller or larger increments, but this one's $5 increments. And so that exercise price, pardon me, the exercise price here starts at 130, and then it goes all the way up to 140 for these different options. That 138 and a quarter, you notice it's the same for all of them. That's because that's the current stock price. And so if we look at, if we look at, let's see the one that they've got circled there. What is, so that's a, uh, for, for the call option, what is the intrinsic value of that 135 strike? Stock's currently at 138 and a quarter. The call option has a strike price of 130. Five. Yeah, so it's basically three dollars and twenty-five cents. Now, what is the option actually selling for? It's actually selling for four and three quarters. Remember, we said as long as there's time left to expiry, these things will always be selling for more than their intrinsic value. So, how much is the speculative value of this option. It's selling for four and three quarters. The intrinsic value is three and a quarter. So what are we looking at here? Yeah, one and a half. So the, the, the speculative value of this is a buck fifty. Now, is there any intrinsic value if we look at the put option here? There's no intrinsic value because in order for a put to be in the money, this strike price has to be above the stock price. And so anything we see here at all represents purely speculative value. What are they speculating on? They're speculating that this stock will fall below 135 before the expiration date in July. By the way, notice that we've got more than one 130 here. We've got one that expires in October. We've got one that expires in January. We've got um, more than one 135, more than one 140. And the longer time you have until expiry, the more these things are worth because there's a greater amount of time for the stock price to change. Does that make sense? Okay. Questions so far? So, since in the, in the UK they don't count it until it expiry, does that mean they have speculative? Yes, and here's why. Because you can buy and sell options. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So, if I think it's going to go up or down, then I would go ahead and buy, buy the option from someone else, right? That's a good question. And earlier I said that it's never an option optimal to exercise an option early. What should you do instead of exercising it? You should sell it because not only do you collect the intrinsic value, which is all you would get if you exercised it, you also collect the speculative value. Good question, thank you. Okay. Now, here's a question. If I went out there to buy a contract 
for this contract right here, the call, how much money would I need? Four hundred seventy-five dollars. How did you come up with that number? Multiply that by one hundred. Yeah, because how many shares are in a contract? One hundred. This is another thing that newbies fail to recognize: is that they think they're buying something at four and three quarters, and then suddenly four hundred seventy-five dollars gets deducted from their account. <gasps> right? Does anyone know if you can trade options commission free? I think Robinhood does. You think that so? That was their big pull. Yeah, well, I know they did equities free. Yeah. But I don't know if they did options free. But I will tell you this uh, the commissions on options typically are higher. And so when we talk about these profits and the payoffs, does, did we talk about commissions there at all? No. So when we get right down to it, I said this thing is a zero sum game, but it's actually worse than that because the people on both ends are paying a commission. Does that make sense? And so it's actually a negative sum game when you get right down to it. Who's the only person that always wins? The broker. Does that make sense? Okay. Now we're on to something called put call parity. And that equation that you see up there at the top is one that you should very definitely have on your note sheet. That equation you see up at the top is one you should very, very much have on your note sheet. And let's talk about what all of these things are. A uh, piece of zero is the value of a put option at time zero. S sub zero is the stock price at the same time. C sub zero is the value of a call option at time zero. E is the exercise price. E is the exercise or strike price. By the way, uh, our book uses E, another common letter used for the strike price is K. Does anyone have any idea why you would use K for a strike price? Baseball. Yeah, baseball. What's the letter you write down for a strike? K. K. Does that make sense? This is why only Americans can understand it when we use K, right? Okay. And maybe Japanese people. Okay, back to the story. R. R is the risk-free rate. R is the risk-free rate. And T is the time left to expiry. T is the time left to expiry. Now one of the things we have to be careful of is that the time units for R and T are the same. If T is in months, R needs to be in months. If T is in years, R needs to be in years. Now, something else freaky going on here. This, uh, this is basically the present value of the expiry at the risk-free rate, right? So, what, and but it doesn't allow for compounding. So you may also see this thing written as follows. P sub zero plus S sub zero equals C sub zero plus E divided by like that. This would be continuous compounding. So if a problem tells you to use continuous compounding, this is what you would do. Now, you may also see it written like this.
That's exactly the same thing. Because all this negative exponent means is that you're dividing by the positive of that. And so these are exactly the same thing. So you could use either one of these formulas. Now how are you going to get E on your calculator? Does anybody know? Go ahead and unshuck your calculator there. Get your calculator, get it out. Look for a button that says LN. LN, do you see it? Let's see, where's it at? It's right next to the seven. Just to the left of the seven is a button that says LN. Now I want you to look directly above it and tell me what it says. Yes. Yeah, E to the X, right? Yeah, it's an exponent. And so what, how do we access the stuff that is above the keys. What button do we have to hit? Second. Second. So here's what we're going to do. We are going to take our required or our risk-free rate times the time. We're going to hit our plus minus button, and then we will hit second LN. And that will give us this piece right here. And then we just multiply that by the exercise price. Let me say that one more time. First step, multiply R and T together. First step, multiply R and T together. Second step, hit your plus minus button. Second step, hit your plus minus button. Third step, hit the second button. Fourth step, what's the fourth step? What's the last step? LN. LN. And when you do that, you get this piece right here. So to get this term, then all you'd have to do is multiply by the exercise price. I guarantee you, at least one of you, is going to email me asking how to do that. And it's probably someone sitting here today, not just the people that missed. Don't feel bad. I'll walk you through it. Not a problem. If the problem says to use continuous compounding, this is how we do it. If it doesn't, this is how we do it. Now, here's a dirty little secret. Probably, if you're dealing with multiple choice, which you are for homework and the exam, probably these answers are going to be so close that you'd still get it right. Even if they say continuous and you did it that way, you'd probably still get it right. Even if it's not continuous and you do it this way, you'd probably still get close. In other words, closer than any other answer choice. But if you want to be sure, you need to know this other way. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, let's talk about where, how we came up with this. Let's talk about the, the, the right-hand side of it. The C is a call option. And what we're looking at here, it's a call option with um, ex exercise price of 25. And so that's when the payoff starts to stop or stops being zero. It starts to go up by a dollar with every dollar of the share price. And so basically what that right hand side of the equation says that it's the value of a call option plus the value of a risk free bond that has a mature value of the exercise price. In other words, pays the exercise price on expiry. And so if we want to find out what is the combined value of those two things today, all we have to do is take the value of the call option and add the present value of that exercise price bond out here at expiry. And so that's what's happening there. Now let's look at what that means for our picture. So down at the bottom we've got that call and then that $25 bond, regardless of the stock price, since it's risk-free, it's going to pay us $25. And so it's $25. If we add those two things together, what we get is that red line. The red line that starts at $25 and then goes over, once we, the stock price hits $25, it starts going up a dollar for every dollar that the stock price goes up. So that's the right-hand side of this equation. 
And the reason I'm putting you through this is because I'm getting ready to show you that it gives us exactly the same payoff as a put option plus the stock price. Now, of course, the strike price has to be the same for the put option, the call option, and the uh, value of that bond that we're talking about, and the expiry date also has to be the same. So everything is the same except one of these things is a put and one of them is a call. Okay, now what if we had a put option? The payoff for the put option is going to be a zero right until the stock price falls below 25. And then it's going to start gaining a dollar for every dollar that the share price loses. And the most it can lose below that exercise price is 25. So the most that this thing is going to pay off is 25. Now, what if we also buy the shares? What's the stock value at zero? Zero. What is it at 10? It's 10. What is it at 25? It's 25, right? And so the stock price is just a straight line. If we add these two things together, as the stock price goes up, the value of the, or the path of the put goes down by the same amount. And so when you add those two together, they always add the 25. When you add those two together, they always add the 25 until we hit that exercise price. And so basically now we can see that this combination, the put plus the stock price, stays at 25 right up until we hit 25, and then it gains a dollar of value for every dollar the share price goes up over 25. Now, you see this payoff, does it look familiar? It's exactly what we just had here. The payoff is exactly the same for the portfolio because you got 25 right until you hit that strike price of 25 and then it starts climbing by a dollar for every dollar the share price goes up. So there is my visual proof to you that these things are identical. And that's why we can construct this equation the way that we do. Does that make sense? It's always going to be true. This put-call parity relationship is always going to be true. Okay, I think you've probably had enough options for today. Do, do you feel like this is harder to understand than a lot of our material? Yes, it absolutely is. Does that mean you need more practice? Yes. Does that mean you need to go back and watch this lecture even if you were here? Yes. Okay, so the last section we talked about the value of an option at expiry. And really that's uh, just intrinsic value at that point. But we said that if it's any time up to the expiry, then there's also this speculative value of the option. And figuring out that speculative value is very difficult. In fact, it wasn't until 1973, well, I was two years old, it wasn't until 1973 that Fisher Black and Myron Scholes figured out how to do this. And what they did actually revolutionized the options industry because now we know how to value these things. And the Chicago Board of Options Exchange also started, I think, that same year. And so really options, if you want to go back historically, 1973 is about when things really got interesting. So how are we going to do this? Well, let's take a look at an American call option. And we know, so the stock value, we know that's S sub T. It goes up by a dollar for every dollar the stock price goes up. So that's, that's very simple. And then we also know what the call value payoff looks like is zero right up until it hits that exercise price and then it starts climbing one dollar for every dollar that the stock price increases. Does that hockey stick look familiar to you? It should from last time. Okay, now if you look at, so that the green line is the intrinsic value of the call option. That's what we've been talking about so far. But if you went out to buy this thing the price would be somewhere on that red 
curve. That red curve represents the market value of the option. And you remember when I showed you the option quotes, that the quoted price of the option was always higher than the intrinsic value. The quoted price of the option is always higher than the intrinsic value except on the very last day. And so that's what that market value is. It's the speculative value plus the intrinsic value. And that speculative value is all, always greater than zero right up until you get down to the end of the option's life. Now, this bottom part here that says C sub zero, which is the call option price, must fall within max S sub zero minus E, which is the stock price minus the exercise price, or zero. And so we notice that that's, that's going to be the bottom value for this, is the uh, max of that thing. And then uh, so the other, the upper bound, is going to be the stock price itself because nobody's going to pay more for the call option than they would for the stock itself. Why? Any ideas? Why would I buy a call option on something if I could just go out and buy the stock for less? Does that make sense? Okay. So don't do silly stuff like go out and buy, spend money on call options when you can buy the stock for cheaper. Question so far. Now you notice this curve, it's not very, it's not simple like the intrinsic value. And so there's a lot of stuff going on here. So we have to have a fairly complex way to price this thing. And that is the Black-Scholes model. The Black-Scholes model. Oh my goodness. So what we've got here is the stock price times E, or times that, it's the stock price times N, which is part of the, the normal distribution, times D1, and we'll get to D1 here in a minute, minus the exercise price. And by the way, the E to the negative RT, do you recognize that from our put call parity equation? It's the same thing multiplied by the normal distribution outcome D2. Oh my goodness. But it gets worse. We go down and you can look at uh, D2 doesn't look too bad. D1 minus the standard deviation of the value of the asset uh, times the square root of the time left to maturity. That doesn't sound too bad. But look up top. D1 is the natural log of the stock price divided by the exercise price plus uh, the risk-free rate plus the variance of the underlying asset, the stock in this case, divided by 2 times t divided by the standard deviation times the square root of t. Do you guys want to... No, you don't. And I, I'm not going to right? Because this is just too much. And by the way, I have to give you a, a, a normal distribution table, and you would have to use that to figure out all this kind of stuff. And there's no way any of you would ever get the right answer. I did this stuff in doctoral school, and in fact I derived this thing in doctoral school, and I'm so glad that I've done that and it's in my past, right? Because this, this looks like pain, and it is. Now, why then do we talk about it if not going to make you use it? And the answer has to do with, it tells us some things. It tells us what are the things that go into valuing options. And the first thing is the stock price. Remember, the higher the stock price is, the more a call option is worth. Especially after it gets greater than that exercise price, then the value of that thing starts climbing a dollar for every dollar. That's the intrinsic value, plus you got the speculative value. The put option is absolutely the other way. As stock price goes up, the value of the put option goes down because you're getting further and further out of the money. Because remember, if you own a put option, what you want is for that stock price to go as low as possible. And then we have the exercise price, and it's just the opposite. The lower the exercise price is, the more valuable your call. And the higher the exercise price is, the more valuable your put. In other words, your call option, you'll come near being able to exercise it if it's got a lower exercise price. And your put option, you'll be more able to exercise it if it has a 
higher exercise price. So far, this all makes fairly good sense. And then we have the interest rate. And it is positive with the call and negative with the put. And if we look at, let's see, what's our put call period? Let me see if I can remember from, uh, we've got, is it stock price plus put is equal to call plus exercise divided by one plus R to the T, is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Now, if we solve this thing for the put option, it looks like this. Put option is equal to stock plus call option plus... That's actually negative, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> 1 plus R to the T. So, as the interest rate gets higher, then this thing gets smaller and your put option is worth less. Does that make sense? Let's go through that one more time. What happens as R gets larger here? What happens to this thing on the bottom? It gets bigger. Yeah, it gets bigger. And if we're dividing by a bigger number, what does that do to this whole thing here? Makes it smaller. And if you hold everything else constant, then that makes our piece of zero lower. And so that's why put value and the interest rate go in the opposite direction. Now, let's work this uh, the other way. What if we say C sub zero is equal to S sub zero plus P sub zero minus E over one plus R to the T. Now, as interest rates go up, this thing gets smaller, so we're subtracting a smaller number. If we're subtracting a smaller number, what does that do to C sub zero? Yeah, it makes it bigger. And so that's how we can know for sure that this is correct, that when interest rate goes up, the value of a call option goes up. When interest rate goes up, the value of a put option goes down. Now, the thing, the true, the true thing, that, the big thing that came out of this whole option pricing model is what volatility does. Remember, volatility is that standard deviation, that risk. And so the riskier something is, the greater the value of both of these things. We knew that. We just didn't know how to quantify it until Black and Scholes came along. Here's how we knew it. Here's the, the logic. What's more likely, so let's assume that it's call option. Let's assume this is the strike price here. What's more likely to hit that strike price? Something that has very little volatility or something that has a lot of volatility? Yeah, the second one is far more likely to actually make it up to that strike price and get into the money. So therefore, it's more valuable. The, the, the option on the volatile asset is more valuable. Let's think about put options. You've got your exercise price down here. You've got your stock price down here. What's more likely to make it down into the money? One that's very smooth or one that's doing this. It's the more risky one that's more likely to actually put that option into the money. And so that makes perfect sense. And then there is the expiration date or expiry. The longer the time to expiry, the more value both of these options are. Why? Because you've got a longer amount of time for this volatility. You've got a you've got a longer amount of time for that stock to actually make it to a position where the option is in the money. So let's talk about that expiry in terms of the job offer. Last time I told you we could think of job offers as, a, as an option. It gives you the right but not the obligation. And the longer they give you to decide, the more valuable that is. Why? Because if they tell you that you have to tell them by tomorrow, what's the probability that you're going to get another job in the meantime? Pretty low, right? But if they give you five days, your chances are five times as much that you'll get another job offer. And so that, that, that option is valuable. 
One of the things that really drives me nuts at this university is that we make offers to people and we say, oh, just take as long as you want. And so in the meantime, if we told them you have to tell us within two weeks and they told us no, we could go out and reach out to the second favorite candidate, right? But instead, we're like sitting around, we're like, oh yeah, we're pretty sure he'll show up. And then he does it, right? And so then we reach out to the second and third and fourth favorite candidates, and they're just no longer there. You are very fortunate in our department. We understand how this works. And so uh, everyone that you interact with in the finance department was our first choice. So you don't have to worry about that. Yeah, some of the other departments, phew, you're on your own. You need to figure that out for yourself. Okay, now we've already talked about this value of the call and, and how it's bounded. And by the way, you can figure out the value of the put from the value of the call, so we won't even talk about that. But this is what's going on with how these different things affect option value. Now, do you think you should have this little chart on your note sheet? Yeah, I think you should. And I think you'll probably see this in a conceptual question because I can't make you do a calculation because after all, I just told you that we're not actually going to do Black-Scholes option pricing model calculations in this class. Any questions? Okay. So, we can think of levered equity as a call option. What does levered mean? Ms. Herdman, what does levered mean? Okay, so you're going with the pure mechanical description, but in finance, when we say someone's using leverage, what do we mean? Debt. Yeah, when someone's using debt. And so if there's any debt whatsoever at the firm, we can think of the levered <coughs> equity, meaning the shares of that firm that also has debt, we can think of that as being a call option. Now what's the underlying asset there? So we've been talking about stock options, and the underlying asset was a share of stock. But here we're talking about the actual assets of the firm being the, the assets that underlie the option. Remember we said that all derivatives derive their value from the value of an underlying asset. And that's what we're talking about here. This is just the assets of the firm. And the strike price is just the payoff amount of the bond. So, Let's assume that the company has one bond outstanding and that bond, what's the face value of that bond? Do I even have to tell you? Thousand, Thousand bucks, very good, okay. So, and we have the maturity date of the bond. So we know when that's going to mature, which is the date on which I'll have to pay that thousand dollars. So do you already see that we've got some of this option framework here? We've got the timed expiry, We've got the amount of money that we have to spend in order to obtain that asset. And so the way it works is that managers will watch and if at the maturity of that bond, if the assets of the firm are worth more than the value of the debt, then they will exercise the call option by paying off the debt. Remember, that's the strike price. So they've got to pay off the debt and then any money that's left over, over and above that, that's positive value to the shareholders. But let's assume that the firm is, uh, this, we've still got this one bond outstanding, and the assets, the whole business, is only worth $900 at the end of this whole thing. What are the managers going to do? You think they're going to pay off the debt? No, they're going to walk away, and they're going to let the bondholders take over the assets. Now, is that good news for the bondholders? No, they basically lost 100 bucks. They were hoping for $1,000 in cash, and instead they've got assets that are only worth 900 So it's bad news for the bondholders. Who benefits? The shareholders, because they've been able to get rid of these assets for 900 instead of keeping them for a thousand. Does that make sense? Okay, so 
Why do I tell you all this? I tell you this because I want you to start thinking of equity not just as shares like we had before, but you can think of them as options. The equity is a call option on a levered firm. Now, can you think that way about a firm with no debt? No, it has to be a levered firm because otherwise there is no face value to pay off and there's no maturity date, right? So if you have a pure equity firm, we cannot think of their stock as being a, a call option. Does that make sense? Okay. So you can also think of it as a put option and uh, the underlying asset is once again the assets of the firm, the strike price is the payout for the bond, but now we can think of putting those assets to the bondholders and they're gonna pay us, basically, basically they're going to pay us $1,000 for those assets instead of the 900 that they're truly worth. Now, when do they actually give us the 1,000? they give it to us up front when we borrow the money. So the timing is a little off here as far as the way our put option is described, but it's the same general idea. And so if the assets are worth more than uh, the strike price at the end, then that, op that put option is out of the money and the shareholders will not be exercising it. However, if the value is lower than the strike price, then that put option is in the money and the shareholders will exercise it. So it's the same story looked at from two different perspectives. We could either think of it as call option or put option. Now, here's the fun thing. What does volatility do to the value of both of those things? It yeah, it increases them. And so this, uh, the, the higher the volatility, the more value both of these will be. Okay, let's see what kinds of situations this applies to. We're going to talk about how this impacts capital budgeting and how it impacts our mergers and diversification ideas. I actually do this in the opposite direction, sorry about that. Uh, so the opposite order. First we're going to talk about mergers and diversification. Remember when we were in chapter 21, I told you that occasionally you will hear managers who are buying other firms in, and it's a conglomerate acquisition, meaning they're not doing the same thing like when Haynes, or when uh, Sarah Lee bought Haynes, that's a conglomerate acquisition. One of the things the managers will say is, oh, it's great because it diversifies the risks of the firm. What did we, did we say that was a good argument or a bad argument? It's a bad argument, and it's a bad argument because these people are diversifying the firm when it is far easier and cheaper for us to diversify our portfolio. So I would rather Sarah Lee stick to their knitting, or not knitting in this case, because stay out of the underwear business, I would rather them stick to what they're good at, and if I also want to own Haynes, then I will uh, then I'll also buy their shares. Now, some of you may have noticed that I did not shame Mr. Scarborough for being late. And let me tell you why. Mr. Scarborough, where have you been? U-Haul. U-Haul. I have been to the U-Haul place so many times, and I understand it. And, and I was going to tell you my favorite U-Haul story. My wife and I are escaping from Ohio. We're crossing the bridge into Indiana in a, a U-Haul truck, and we notice... I noticed that the, uh, the power steering gets a little stiff, and then we noticed that the air conditioner isn't working anymore, and I'm like, oh, we gotta get across this bridge. And so we crossed the bridge into Richmond, Indiana, and luckily there, at the first stop, is there's an exit, and it goes right to a Hampton Inn, which is where we like to hang. And so I, I like cripple this thing into the parking lot, and then I'm, I'm pulling a car behind us. So I'm trying to get this thing, and I, and I ask my wife to get out and give me the hand signals, right? <laughs> and she gets out, and instead of giving me hand signals, she's frozen like that scream character that's on my wall, the painting. And I get out, and I'm like, what's going on? 
At which point she tells me that the truck's on fire. <laughs> and so I pop up, it's one of those where the whole cab comes, up, pop up the whole front end of the truck, whew, thing bursts into flames. Yeah, not a fan of U-Haul. Penske, pods, so much better. U-Haul runs their stuff into the ground. I always see this, and then they, then they sell it at really ridiculously low prices, of course, and people actually buy this crap. I'm like, do you have a freaking death wish? Okay, so that's why you have my sympathy. That's why I did not shame Mr. Scarborough. Okay, now, diversification. We said uh, the reason these managers are really doing that is because it doesn't, it's not for your benefit as a shareholder, it's for their own benefit because they have this undiversified portfolio, which is mainly Sarah Lee stock, and because they can't sell their Sarah Lee stock without the market interpreting it as a bad sign, what do they do instead? They diversify Sarah Lee. Does that make sense? They're just doing this for them, not for you. Okay, so diversification, we know when we diversify our portfolio, it reduces the volatility of the portfolio. And so that's exactly what's going on when you have a diversifying merger. And so the volatility goes down. Now remember we said that uh, equity could be thought of as a call option or a put option. What happens to the value of those options as volatility goes down? Yeah, they both lose value. And so this diversifying acquisition, if we look at it from an options framework, we can see easily that it is not in the interest of the shareholders. It's not in the interest of the shareholders. Now, that's assuming the firm has leverage, right? Okay, now, let's see. Uh, let's assume that diversification is the only benefit to the merger. Of course, they're gonna tell you there are lots of other benefits and most of them are just total crap but because uh, managers lie. But let's talk about this. We've already talked about how equity can be viewed as a call option. The merger's gonna decrease the value of the equity. But let's talk about debt. One of the things we haven't discussed about here is the value of a risky bond. We can actually think of the value of a risky bond being the value of a risk-free bond minus the value of a put option. And remember, the riskier the bond is, the higher the required return, the lower the present value of the future cash flows. And so this risk-free bond is going to have a higher value than the risky bond. And that difference can be thought of as the value of the put option. It can be thought of as the value of the put option. Okay, now, if volatility is decreasing, actually, let's rearrange this. No, no, that's fine. Yeah. If volatility is decreasing, what happens to the value of that put option? Yeah, it decreases. And so since we're subtracting a smaller number, what does that do to the value of the risky bond? It increases, right? If we're subtracting a smaller amount, the value increases. Now, what does that mean? It means that we are actually transferring wealth to the bondholders. So this diversifying acquisition for the investors has the effect of basically transferring wealth from the shareholders to the bondholders. Now, if you're a bondholder, is that good news to you? Oh yeah, you're thrilled. But what's the goal of financial management? Maximize shareholder wealth. Did we mention the bondholders anywhere in there? No. And what we're doing is actually lowering shareholder wealth. And the people we're benefiting are the bondholders, and the bondholders are not who we're responsible for taking care of, other than our legal obligations to pay the debt, right? So that's why, using an options framework, we can show that this is basically, if you do a diversifying merger for a leveraged firm, all it does is take money away from the shareholders and give it to the debt holders. Does that make sense? Okay. And we've already discussed that. Um, 
Yeah, we've been over that entire slide. Now let's talk about options and capital budgeting. So all along we've been telling you, don't accept negative NPV projects. And I'm, I'm going to tell you, that's still the advice I'm going to give you. But options framework tells us that there are, there's at least one situation in which you might accept a negative NPV project. And that would be if the firm is highly leveraged and that slightly negative NPV project makes the, the underlying assets riskier. Why would we want to make the underlying assets riskier? What happens to the value of the call option as the risk goes up on the underlying asset? Yeah, it also goes up. And so as a result, taking on this risky project actually boosts the value of the call option that is the equity of a levered firm. And so you might go out there and just take on something crazy risky that has a low or negative, slightly negative NPV just to be able to juice the riskiness of your underlying assets just to get the value of that call option up. And uh, if, if you've ever been involved in football, we would call this the Hail Mary Pass. You guys know what a Hail Mary Pass is? I'm going to ask Ms. Craven to describe for us what a Hail Mary Pass is. Yeah. Right. Very good. Okay. So uh, let me just encapsulate that from a non-sports perspective. <laughs> when you're way away from possibly making the goal, you may do something really crazy, like trying to throw the football 75 yards, right? And hoping that someone's down there to pick that thing up. Now, what's the probability of a Hail Mary pass being completed? Very low. Very low. But if you make it, usually you're doing this when you're like, what, five points or less down, right? And so you do that, do you win the game? Yeah. If you don't do it, you're going to lose the game anyway, right? And so basically there's nothing but off upside on this, you know, your fourth and whatever. There's no downside but there's only possibly upside. And we see the same thing at the firm. If the managers think they can do something really crazy, and, and by the way, the firm's gonna go bankrupt anyway, but what if they could do something really, really crazy that has a small probability of succeeding? It's one of these heads I win, tails you lose situations. If it works out, the shareholders get the benefits of it, but if it doesn't, who takes it on the nose? <clears throat> who takes it on the nose in a bankruptcy? CEO. Say again? CEO. Oh, well, they're going to, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, as far as shareholders and debt holders, who takes it? Who's going to end up with the assets of this wreckage of a firm? The debt holders, right? When you, when you do bankruptcy, the debt holders get the assets. Now, if we didn't do the uh, Hail Mary pass, the value, and, and if we didn't do it, and the firm just went bankrupt, the value of the assets are gonna be higher than it will be if we try the Hail Mary pass and fail, they will have destroyed even further value in the firm. But do they care? No. Do the debt holders hope for the company to try a Hail Mary pass? No, because the chances are it's not going to succeed, and if it doesn't, it's going to destroy the value of the assets that they're going to get. The equity holders are like, oh, hell yeah, check that thing. Let's see if someone will catch it. Does that make sense? Because if it does, then if, the, if they do complete the pass, then the shareholders uh, get money and if they don't they're no worse off than they would have been anyway okay now 
Let's talk about some real situ a real situation in which this happened. Back in the late 1970s, we had these things called savings and loans. There's still a few of them around. And these folks made a bunch of shaky real estate loans. And their portfolios of loans were horribly undiversified. And then, uh, so then we had this inverse yield curve problem when Paul Volcker starts to try to kill off inflation, which by the way, we're getting into the same situation again. Inverse yield curve where it's higher on the short end than it is on the long end. And so basically that's a bank killer. Because remember, banks make their money by borrowing money at short term on the low end and loaning it out at higher interest rates on the high end. Well, so these people are suddenly sitting on a bunch of assets and they're having to pay their depositors 12, 13 percent, but they're only getting 7 percent for the money they've got loaned out. So that puts you in a bad situation in a hurry. What's the only way to make this thing pay off? They do some crazy, crazy loans that are extraordinarily risky that if they pay off will basically save the savings and loan. Now, do you think most of those loans worked out? No. And so the savings and loans went belly up. Now, in this case, the depositors would usually be the people to take it on the nose because they're the ones who are lending to the savings and loan. But instead, what happens? I'll give you a hint. Four letters starts with F. Oh, by the way, it doesn't end with K. <laughs> FDIC, right? The Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation comes in and bails out the depositors. The FDIC, I'll give you a hint, who it belongs to, it starts with F because it's federal, right? It's part of the federal government, right? And so now, who's on the hook? And who's the government? Do you have a job? Do you get, pay, do you get the full amount that they're supposed to pay you, or do they take some money out? Taxes! By the way, we borrowed a bunch of money to bail those out. We're still paying interest on that debt. So part of the taxes that you're paying go to something that happened a long time ago, right? Does that make sense? Do you think we're, we're doing more and more of this stuff? Yeah, take a look at, at uh, the, uh, I won't get into it because it gets a little political, but the point is this, when the government jumps in, people always think the government is just magic, right? But the money comes from somewhere and taxes, at the end of the day, it has to be taxes. Questions? Um, so when, if, is it, if the firm is highly leveraged and it has um, substantial increase in the standard deviation? Okay, so or, or. first thing is the firm has to be highly leveraged, okay. meaning that, we, and I'll give you the, once again the example of the savings and loan or banks, mm -hmm. they're running on 90% debt, 10% right. equity, right? So that's stage number one. And stage number two is, I have to have the opportunity to take on some crazy, risky project. So let's talk about SpaceX. Let's assume SpaceX was highly leveraged. And SpaceX is on the verge of bankruptcy because Starlink isn't working as well as they thought. They've been building this, this Starship thing. It's all stainless steel. It's pretty sexy. It looks like something out of the 1930s movie serials, right? Okay. Now, is this thing ready for prime time? No. But what if they were able to get someone to pay them a significant amount of money if they were able to complete an extraordinarily risky mission with that rocket? So uh, if they're going to fire the rocket off, probably got about a 5% chance or less that it's going to be successful. But if it is successful, their problems are over. The stock has a positive value. If it fails, the firm goes into bankruptcy, but guess what? They were going into bankruptcy anyway. You see how that works? Mm -hmm. Questions? Okay, so investing in real projects and options. You can think of um, projects not only having an NPV, but, and, and so NPV of their own, but they could also have an NPV that reflects an option value of a follow-on project. And this kind of tells you how old these slides are when I talk about SAW and SAW 2. 
So I could I could make this even weirder. Let's talk about uh, Avatar. That movie's like way old. <coughs> now, when is the sequel coming out? December. Right? Yeah, it's it's like this this year, and so it's been like what twenty years. It takes a lot of time to make those movies. It does. <laughs> And the good news is, you don't have to worry about your actors getting old and unattractive. Because they're all blue cartoon people, right? Okay. So it does take a while. Now, could they be making Avatar 2 if they hadn't made the original Avatar? No. And we see this, we use movies a lot, but uh, if Apple hadn't made... So there are several of these with Apple. If they hadn't launched iTunes, or iTunes might have been a negative MPV project in and of itself, but the option to do the, uh, what's it called, uh, I, Apple, okay, so Apple Music, iTunes, in theory, oh, so Apple Music is way down the line, but you're right. Um, and then there's the, uh, not the iPhone, what came before it? iPod. iPod, very good. So the iPod, doing iTunes gave them the option to do the iPod, and it also gave them the option to do Apple Music down the road. So even if iTunes had been slightly negative MPV on its own, the option to do those other two things might have made it positive MPV. My favorite example on this, Toyota Prius. You guys know what a Toyota Prius is? Okay, uh, you guys probably remember kind of a, a futuristic looking one as the first one you recall, but there was actually one that came out before that and it was awful. Oh my goodness, the first Toyota Prius has to be one of the ugliest vehicles that I've ever laid my eyes on, and I've been to Eastern Europe. So, really ugly car, and it wasn't all that great. But, they learned a boatload from building that original Prius, and that allowed them then to move on to the first Prius that you guys remember, which was actually quite profitable. And so even though that original Prius was probably a negative NPV project in and of itself, the ability that they had after that to do the next Prius, that option had a high enough value that it was worth doing that negative NPV project up front. Does that make sense? Actually, any project to build a prototype is negative NPV if you just look at that project by itself because you're not going to end up selling a prototype but it gives you then the option to start production. Does that make sense? So we can think of real uh, projects having options. And that is the end of chapter 17. I still have 30 minutes left. Now I'm not gonna take the whole 30 minutes, but I am going to grill you here a little bit and I will pick on people one at a time Mr. Zach, what does an increase in volatility do to the value of a call option? Increase. Very good. The first one. So what uh, does the increase in volatility do to the value of a option? Very good. What does the increase, Mr. Scarborough, what does, oh, he wasn't here, I'm not going to speak on him. <laughs> I still have you hold sympathy pains for him. <laughs> Ms. Meek. What does the increase in the stock price do to the value of a call option? Increases. Yeah. What does the increase in the value of stock do to the value of a put option? It decreases. No, it decreases. She had a 50-50 shot. <laughs> <laughs> usually do. <laughs> okay, so here's the trick. It's actually valuable to have someone like Ms. Gass around. <laughs> because given two choices, she will always choose the wrong one. And so all we do is we say, should we or should we not? She says, don't do it. What do we do? Go right. right. Does that make sense? You're very valuable. You just need to realize what your skill is. Anything's marketable. And on the internet, that's passable. They're true. If you don't believe me, just Google used socks. Okay. <laughs> Some sick people out there. Okay, so let's see who else can I pick on today. Oh, she's hiding her face. <laughs> oh, Miss <laughs> Craven. <laughs> she was hiding so well she didn't even realize I was sneaking up on her. Miss Craven, what happens to the value of a call option as the exercise price gets higher? Lowers. Decreases. Yeah, absolutely. 
Okay. I had things for it. Don't do that to me. I'm nervous. I left her hanging for a microsecond. She was about to freak out. Ms. Hip, what happens to the value of a put option as the exercise price increases? It goes up. Oh, very good. Let's see, what have I missed here? Oh, interest rates. I'm going to have to look at this equation over here. Look at this. What happens to the value of the put option as interest rates go up? Yeah, it decreases because this thing gets bigger, so this whole thing gets smaller. It makes our put option worth less. What happens to the call option as interest rates go up? It makes this thing larger, so it makes this thing smaller. We're subtracting a smaller thing, and so the call option becomes worth more. I can look at the value of a firm, the equity of a firm, as a call option or a put option, but only if the firm has leverage. leverage. Very good. They have to have debt in the capital structure. Otherwise, there's no uh, maturity date and there's no amount of money that we could pay to take advantage, to take control of the assets. We already have it, right? Does that make sense? Oh, okay, so um, firms have to have debt in order for us to use this options framework. And the exercise price is that value that we're going to have to repay at maturity. And that time to maturity, that's the time left to expiry on the option. And so that's why we have to have this debt. And it gives us the ability to, we can either think of it as put the assets to the bondholders or we can use it as a, you think of it as a call option and the strike price is paying that amount of money to uh, buy the assets from the bondholders. So either way, we could think of it as a call option or a put option, but either way, increasing the volatility of the underlying assets will do what to the value of the equity of the firm? And it drives it up, right? Okay, now, knowing that, when we go out and do a merger, that results in diversification. What does that do to the risk of the underlying assets of the firm? It goes down, right? And so as that risk goes down, that value of the call option that is on this levered equity, what happens to it? It decreases. Who benefits? The bondholders. Yeah, the bondholders. It's just purely a wealth transfer from the equity holders to the bondholders. What's the goal of financial management? Increase, Increase shareholder wealth. If we are taking money away from the shareholders and giving it to the bondholders, are we increasing shareholder wealth? No. no. 